you're not a Maggie Haberman replacement, but the original plan was I was going to talk to Maggie tonight, so I had a whole bunch of questions about normalizing Trump, are you too access dependent, um, how much do you tweet, do you have a tweeting addiction? I'm an excellent reporter. It's pretty good. Yeah. Um, everyone who was here earlier heard me quote you um, to the Facebook folks. So I'm not going to repeat that quote, but okay. I do want to repeat a different part of this same essay. You've given me all my notes today. Um, this is the same essay you wrote that I advised everyone to read on the internet. Um, after you said the media was in crisis and that Google and Facebook are taking majority revenue, you said there is an easy fix to these related problems. The platform should reward valuable content. Round and round with the Facebook folks, it doesn't seem like they're immediately going to cut you any checks. Um, what did you have in mind when you wrote that the platform should reward valuable content. How do you imagine that would work? So we, we already generate a lot of revenue from, from the, the big platforms, from Google, mostly YouTube. Thank you, Susan. Um, from, from Facebook um, with instant articles and some video products they have. Uh, also, um, Amazon has uh, generated a lot of revenue from Amazon. So and, and it's growing very quickly, you know, 100% year over year kind of growth on this, on the, this revenue. So it is happening, and they're reward, they're, they are rewarding um, content. Um, I think the, the big question with Facebook is most of Facebook's revenue is in newsfeed, and that's where they've not shared revenue. Um, you've heard earlier today the phrase surfaces a lot. Well, we have this surface and that surface. I was confused by that. Um, which uh, is a very popular term at Facebook. Good to know. Uh, so the most important surface at Facebook is newsfeed. Right. That's where all the attention is. That's where all Facebook's revenue is. Mobile newsfeed. To yes, to mobile newsfeed. Yeah. Uh, the surface where they share a lot of revenue would be watch or um, instant articles or uh, other, other places where um, there's just a lot less distribution, so there's a lot less, there's, there's a lot less total revenue. And so the question is, will Facebook's newsfeed become a place where they can reward content not just with traffic, but also with revenue? And to me, it feels like Facebook will have no chance to control what's in newsfeed if the only lever they have is traffic. Because the only way to say we want to have an influence on this content is if you have a lever of traffic and a lever of revenue, because you need revenue to generate content. So, what, so again, what do you want from them? Um, I'm imagining that you've talked with them many times before you wrote an essay in which you said, these guys need to step up and do something. What is the thing that you want from them? I think that, that well, so there's what, uh, I, I, so let me, uh, I think a lot of people are asking Facebook for stuff. I think that traditional media companies are, have an expectation that they can take something that works in print or take something that works on their website, stick it on Facebook, and get a big check from Facebook, and that's what they want. And they don't really want to change or adapt. What I want to do is build new models for content that are truly social, and that's at least with what I want to do with, with Facebook. And that's what we've always done. We always think, how do we make content that people will engage with and share? And yep. if we make a tasty video, will they actually cook the food? If we do a nifty thing, will they spend a weekend doing a DIY project? When, they, when we do BuzzFeed lists, do they tag their friends and joke and laugh with their friends? So we want to figure out, how do you make content truly social? And so that's the creative thing that's exciting to me. And that's what we've done from the early days of, of BuzzFeed. We were making content for Facebook before Facebook had content on it, when it was really just purely social. So that's what's exciting to me creatively. What I think um, fin uh, you know, mon financially or in a business proposition is, if Facebook wants that kind of content, if they want content that, that drives meaningful time, if they want content that drives um, certain types of behavior, the algorithm should dispense traffic and the algorithm should dispense money. It should be both. It, there should be an, and that money would be from advertising. It would say, "Here is a cut of the advertising." That's yeah. essentially what you're asking. A, cu a cut right? of, the, of the newsfeed advertising. If you want to have influence over what's in newsfeed, so that you can do the values that matter to you as a company, if you're Facebook, you need to find a way to make that economically sustainable. And the place where all the activity, all the engagement, all the attention, all the monetization ha is happening is newsfeed. And so, to me, it seems very much in Facebook's interest. To, to be able to have two levers, traffic and revenue. So, um, like to, to Susan, you know, Susan, who was just talking about uh, uh, with Kara about demonetizing people who are going against YouTube's policies. To have the lever of demonetizing is very powerful to have less offensive content on your platform. Facebook doesn't have the power to demonetize because they're not, they're not monetizing in the first place. Why, why do you think they haven't 
gone into that revenue split model that, that YouTube has. Um, that YouTube's had that for a very long time. Facebook certainly knows about it. Um, and again, or for another way, when you talk to Chris Cox or Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg and you say, this is what I want, because you probably talked to them many times, what do they say? Um, so it depends who you talk to at Facebook. And I obviously won't share personal uh -huh. conversations I've had you know, or business conversations I've had with Facebook. But I think people have different views within the company, and they're trying to figure it out. And I actually think in good faith they're trying to figure it out, and they're trying to find a model, model that will work. And the recent changes to newsfeed, I think were sometimes mischaracterized as saying, oh, they're just stepping back from publishing and saying, okay, you guys are complaining, we'll just, we'll just take, take away distribution. I don't think that's actually what was happening. I think what actually was happening is they're trying to do what they're good at, which is social, and they're trying to make sure the content that appears in newsfeed is also social, uh, and they are trying to figure out how to sustain uh, so social content and newsfeed and what the economic models are for that. And I think some people within Facebook would like to say, do it on other surfaces. That's certainly their public statement so far. It's, oh, talk to, to, to about doing a show for Watch or you know, have your articles, in, instant articles, or there's going to be a mid-roll in, in some longer videos. Yep. Diff different places not in newsfeed. And some people, I think, believe that that's the right path forward for Facebook and that the newsfeed shouldn't really have um, uh, revenue uh, sharing with, with content producers. I think there's also people within Facebook who think it should and realize that that would be a good way to have a lot more control over the quality of newsfeed. This isn't the first time you've, you've had issues with Facebook. I mean, you've, you've worked with them a long time. Um, Tasty, which has been this really powerful engine for you, became a powerful engine because you worked out a deal with them privately, which basically led to them, to, what's the official term? It's branded content, right? There was no way to sort of make money from branded content, and then they allowed you to do that. I may, I may, I may be yeah, describing I, it incorrectly. Basically, you got something out of them. You got them to do it. Um, I don't know that we got anything out of do it, but we, we took the approach of, well, eventually Facebook will find large, scalable, global ways of generating, uh, of sharing revenue with content creators if they want the content. But there was a time when you couldn't make money from Tasty, and then they basically flipped a switch, and you could. Uh, yeah. 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 So I, I think that we always said, well, if we can make great branded content, if we can put, do product placement, or if we can find other things that don't detract from the experience of the, of, of the, of the user, and that also allows to monetize that, and, and we disclose in a straightforward way, we can do that. And then Facebook started to formalize some of the rules for that. Um, but I think bef but there were a lot of people doing a lot of things on Facebook before that Facebook really had any rules at all. So what, what prompted you, just to go one last time, is what prompted you to write this in December? Um, you've got a good relationship with them. You have access to all the decision makers. Um, what prompted you to come out and say, we have a real problem, media's in crisis, and go directly at Google and Facebook and say this is a problem that they need to solve. What was the thing that led you to that? I mean, partly I think that they're very, they're, both Google and Facebook are very good at solving problems when they put their mind to it. They have a lot of resources. They have a lot of really smart people. Uh, they tend to think about the future and the long term. So they're not just thinking about today. They're thinking a, a yep. little while out. And I don't think they always fully understand the perspective of media or content or other industries. Um, or, or, when, or, or on occasion, I think people at these big tech companies see uh, the people, that, or, or they interact with people at media companies, and they don't think they're that smart, or they don't think they totally get it, or they don't think they get the internet. Oh, we're not as smart as they are. Um, Let's yeah, be honest. They, they, Most they, of us are not. You're, you're, you're <laughs> so I think that there, there's, there's a little bit of a, of a culture. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a miscommunication, cultural miscommunication, and sometimes some condescension. And, and I think partly the reason I wrote that memo was about communicating to my own team at BuzzFeed. This is what our strategy is. Here's what's happening in the industry. Um, but also, it's nice to, ha to, to, to try to communicate to people in the, both tech and media uh, a vision forward and how things could, could work better in the future. I sat with you at South by Southwest three years ago. You had a, a big strategy unveil about distributed content. At the time, you were sort of early to the idea. Everyone here knows what it is, but you were going to publish your stuff widely and, and, and monetize from Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat. Um, since then, you've started focusing again on publishing stuff on your own sites and a bunch of other changes. What, what did you get wrong in 2015 about the distributed content strategy? So uh, 
So the thing we got right was that people would start consuming content not just on websites, but distributed in apps. You were saying this is already happening, but this is going to be our, our business model yeah. is going to be making money when that happens. Yeah, so, uh, but at the time, mostly people were posting links that would get back to your website. So people were s getting samples of content, but not the full content. So putting the full content out was uh -huh. something that was so somewhat new, and it drove a lot of consumption, a lot of video, a lot of, a lot, a lot of growth. I think we did that um, at that point without yet fully understanding or, or thinking through what would the revenue um, models be for that kind of, kind of approach. One model is this is valuable to platforms and the platforms will then share, share revenue, and they have, but not enough. Um, the other model would be um, when you have content that's reaching so many people on so many platforms, you can create branded content and that can travel um, to, to uh, a big audience, you can get paid for that, and that works, but it's not enough on its own. Uh, another model is building a strong brand and having commerce associated with it. So if you um, have lots of people seeing Tasty videos, you, they'll buy a Tasty One Top or a Tasty Cookbook, and that works. But al that alone uh, isn't enough. And so, um, and then the, uh, and so, what we saw and didn't fully realize when we first undertook this. Um, the distributed content model was that you would need to move to, we would need to move to a multi-revenue approach to generate enough revenue on these platforms, um, as opposed to a single revenue model, which is what we were doing, you know, primarily. Uh, right. So by, now, now the new uh, essay is, is nine boxes, and there's a grid and a bunch of different stuff. You've referenced it, like selling kitchen gadgets through Tasty yeah. and lots of different ways of making money. This is what a lot of people are now interested in, right? Like, where can we get revenue everywhere? Let's do it. Um, one thing I didn't see in the box was any sort of consumer subscription uh, plan, which is, again, a lot of the media business is now consumed with charging consumers directly for something. Why, why is that not a priority for you? I think that subscription news and subscription content can be a tremendous business, particularly in news. I think, I think it can be a strong business if you're targeting wealthy consumers who are cost insensitive and, and who will pay a, you know, for a, a, a subscription. I think BuzzFeed's model has always been much more, we're more of a pop, a pop company, a pop, pop culture, pop, yeah. you know, we, we reach a broad public. We reach you know, over 600 million people every, every month, but, and Nielsen now finally measures it, so you can look at Nielsen to yeah. actually track, track our, our, our scale. A and um, particularly with news, uh, a future where every, um, company that's doing quality journalism moves behind a paywall is not good for democracy and it's not good for having a, a broadly educated public. And, for, and, I, and I think as a business model, advertising and partnerships with platforms are, are um, better for companies that reach really large scale and really large, large audiences. I want to ask about news in a second, but, but just again, because you guys do some news, but your bulk of the stuff is, mm -hmm. is entertainment and pop. People will pay for entertainment, right? The Netflix, Netflix is a very good business. 100 million subscribers. Yeah. HBO has less, but they charge yeah. a lot of money. I mean, people will pay to be entertained. People, mm -hmm. 100 million people are paying for cable TV in some form or another. Yeah. Um, isn't there a BuzzFeed product you could sell at some price point to some yeah, there, there, it's, it's def I'm not religious about it. Yeah. I definitely think there could be some interesting models for, for, um, for subscription. Uh, you know, news, I think, is a special case where you know, I just don't like that when there's a natural disaster, they take the paywall down off the New York Times because it's so important. It's like everything is important when it comes to who's going to be the next president and people getting good information, people knowing what's going on, on in the world. But for a lot of other areas, I, I, I think subscription models can be, can be pretty interesting. So Ben Smith, who runs your news group, yep. talked to Peter Latman, who does investments for Lorraine Powell Jobs. Yep. Got your name right. Um, and that surprised me because you have been an ardent defender of, uh, the, talked about maybe was there some way for Lorraine to invest in the company, could it, could, in news, could news be split up? Um, and I was surprised initially because you've been an ardent defender of, of BuzzFeed News. It seems like it's something that's important to you. Um, what's the thinking in that conversation? I mean, you know, Ben Smith and Peter are old friends and uh -huh. they had a beer together and people in news are very interested in any possible, you know, uh, conversations um, that uh, that impact the news industry, and 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 so I think uh, in some ways, kind of blown was kind of blown out of proportion. Um, but I think that you know, we have people come to us all the time with really interesting ideas and interesting possibilities, and we listen to them and we talk to them. And uh, but Ben's a savvy guy. He he knows that if he talks to an investor about some kind of structured deal, even at a very preliminary stage. 
that's a thing. My understanding is he told you he was going to do that, and yeah. you didn't stop him from doing it. So can you imagine a world where someone invests in a portion or all of BuzzFeed News and it becomes well, we've had, I mean, we've had a lot of off? We, or just in BuzzFeed News. I mean, yeah. we've had a lot of investment in BuzzFeed as a company, right. or, you know, over over the years. But in, um, in splitting news off in some way I mean, from the main company. I, I guess all I can say is, I love BuzzFeed News. I love that it's part of BuzzFeed. I think it has a bright future. The the year that that they've had, you know, and and the, the last several years has been tremendous. The the reporting talent we have, the stories we've broken, it is is really incredible. I'm very proud of it, and I also think that. Um, it, it is something that helps us with the biz, as a business, it helps us with the platforms, it helps us in, in, a, in a bunch of different ways, and the only reason I would ever have conversations with anyone about BuzzFeed News is how we can do more or do things in a bigger way. But what is the value of, of news? Again, you, you, you're mostly monetizing the pop stuff, the entertainment stuff, quizzes, viral videos. Do we say viral videos anymore? Um, and news is, up until recently, not something you monetize, you've got a big staff. Um, why fund it at that level? What is the value to the rest of the company as a business? I mean, I think news has been a you know, good business throughout history. People get, think it's not a good business, but uh, it often is a business that takes longer to, to develop because it's based on building trust. It's very hard to build that trust and very hard to build the capacity to do great you know, news and reporting. Um, but once you build it, it's also something that's very hard to replicate. Um, so if you build for the long term, I think news is a is a good business and uh, is a good business. It's good uh, for the world. It's it's good in a whole bunch of ways. When when did you when did it, when did it click for you that that was something you wanted to build up? Because again, the history of BuzzFeed, which you played around, was a sandbox where you built a lot of different stuff, and at some point it became this entertainment pop thing, like you said. Yeah. And then you started investing heavily in news after the fact. I mean, we were, we started as a social content company, and one reason you know Facebook's uh, algorithm changes and shifts are something that has gotten our team really fired up and excited is because it's going back to what was core to BuzzFeed and still is, is core to BuzzFeed, which is thinking of content through the lens of social, like what job does a content do in someone's life? How do you use content to connect with someone else? Um, how do you use content to express your identity? All these ways of thinking about content is something you use, not as something you just consume. Um, and so uh, that's, that's how we started. And then um, people weren't sharing content uh, news content on Twitter or on Facebook. It was tw Facebook was what you had for lunch. Yep. Oh, sorry, Twitter was what you had for lunch. Facebook was how to connect with you know your friends or go to a party or whatever. And when people started sharing news on Facebook, I forget even what the story was, but it was a big news day, and we didn't have any reporters, and we saw that what people were sharing on social was news, and it was a new thing, and we're like, whoa, like we can do news, awesome. Like this is something. Was it the llama? I uh, know it was Before earlier than that. that. This was like years, you know, ancient history. But it, you know, when we were in, like, I, uh, yeah, I remember talking about it with Matt Sapporo, one of our, our you know, yeah. great entertainment writers, and he was like, "Yeah, we're like boxed out today. Everything's about news." Uh, and so we it, it, we realized there was an opportunity, and a presidential election was coming up, so that was a great way to to build our reputation. And so I started trying to uh, find someone who could lead lead news for us. I mean, there was a playbook at Huffington Post, and you were a co-founder of Huffington Post, where, where you built the business to a certain scale, and then you wanted to show that you were more serious and more attracted to brands, and so you would start hiring um, people with, with pedigrees from real organizations, from, real, from old media companies. Um, that's what I thought you were doing initially with BuzzFeed News, and then you really kept going and kept going and kept going. I thought it was a hood or Ben Smith was a hood ornament. Yeah, some version of that. Yeah. You're getting written yeah. about in the New York Times. It's not an unusual thing for people to do, right? Find some yeah. sort of trophy hires. And then they usually decide, ah, it doesn't really work. I don't out. know if it's a company principle, but when we do stuff, we try to do it for real. You know, don't do stuff that's just fake. Don't do partnership that's just a press release. Don't don't hire someone because you want to like see you want to seem like you're doing something. Actually, do the thing you said. Yeah, you're actually do. do the thing. That's do good. do the thing. Do that. Um, you get, speaking of things that I found a little confusing, there's a there's a BuzzFeed News TV show on Twitter. It's like a morning show. Uh, AM to DM. Yeah. Yeah. What's the thinking behind that? Because it doesn't seem like something that. It's it. Um, I can't imagine someone on Twitter saying I would like to watch a morning news show, but on Twitter. Have you watched the show? Yeah. Yeah, and you didn't like I'm not, it? Well, I'm you not the like demo, it? so <laughs> let's leave me out of it for a minute. People like it. It's doing, it's yeah. doing, doing well. It's very, Does that make you know, money for you? Yeah. yeah so yeah. Twitter pays you, or you sell ads, or both? 
Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a partnership with Twitter. There's some money to, to produce the show, but we, we split ad revenue, so there's upside on it, and it's something that we, you know, has been doing great for us. Um, I was surprised, that, again, that you were doing live streaming with Twitter instead of Facebook, but it sounds like Twitter's writing you checks, and that's the answer to that question. Well, I was very excited to hear today from Campbell Brown that, that there's going to be a tab on Facebook for breaking news and watch, um, and that is, it was... A, a, I can't a, tell, but are we, are we... No, I'm not being sarcastic. Okay, okay, she, good. She, I, I just, just as, as I was writing over here, I was looking at what's going on in the conference, and, and Campbell Brown was saying there's going to be a, a, a new show on you are, Facebook. You are that excited not, about that. That, that was, was not thing. a thing. That was not a thing before. Like, Watch wasn't looking for news shows um, until it was just announced on this stage earlier today. So uh, it, the, it's, a, it's an acknowledgment that Facebook needs news. And it's not the... You know, it's not the main reason people come to Facebook, but Facebook needs news and they need quality information. And, and um, I don't know, she didn't say whether people would have, news organizations have to provide that It seems like it's a free. newly hatched idea. Yes. But anyway, it's happening because she said it, she said it in public. Yeah, it's going to happen. So. Um, so don't hold her to it either. But um, what? No, but I'm not, I mean, joking aside, yeah. I am, it is, it's an ex, it's, it's exciting thing that they, they would move in that space. And we've seen it work really well on, on Twitter. Like I said, you co-founded Huffington Post. That company sold for a bunch of money. You got some of that money. How does that affect, how does making money through a, a sale of a company affect the way you view the trajectory of, of the new company that you're running now? Um, when you I think mean, about I think selling, it, not selling? I mean, I think that is personal and depends on the on, on an individual and their relationship to yeah, I'm asking you, know, you. Mo you know, money. Um, I think oh, <laughs> um, you're asking me just yeah. a very personal question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think building something is the motivation and the, and the reward. I think if you, uh, if you can get to a point where you're not worried about money, you know, or feel like, oh, if you take a risk, you might, your family might have, you know, not be able to have, you know, things like medical care or school or things that, that you want to provide for your family, then that could prevent you from taking uh, uh, more risk. I think fortunately, just to make it a little bit less personal, f one nice thing about secondary transactions in companies is that people you know, haven't had to make, founders haven't had to make that yeah. choice. They've said, you know what, I, I want to keep building Facebook or Snapchat or whatever the company is, and I can I can sell you know a few million dollars and and be be wealthy by all normal human you know standards and keep building something for th that I believe has a bright future and could be could be a lot bigger. So so in general, I think whether it's you know selling HuffPost or or secondary that other founders have done. Um, it, it's, it's nice to not have the decision about whether or not to keep building or investing to be based on your own personal finances. It's nice to have it be based on your, your conviction about the company and what you think you can continue to build. So I wasn't asking that just to be an asshole. Um, <laughs> but you guys are not making money, right? There's, you're not profitable. You're burning money still? I mean, we've had year, profitable years and years where we're, where, where we're not profitable. I'm going to assume we don't talk that you're, about our, assume that about you're our, not profitable. Reasonably informed, and and so at some point you're going to have a decision about raising more money, and or selling the company. How are you thinking about that that decision over the next couple of um, years? We're we're well capitalized. Our business is doing well and trending in the right direction, and and so uh, we're not we're not in the market to raise money, and don't have any plans to raise money in the near future. Okay. Do you want me to keep asking personal questions? <laughs> well, yeah, if you want. No, nah, it's good. <laughs> um, you guys probably have questions, personal or not, and if not, I'll keep going. Let's give them a second to get up. No? Here's Jack Conte. Hi. Yeah. Um, what makes a great piece of content? What makes people share something? Yeah, so uh, I think that it, 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 the, the way that we think about content is that content does a job in someone's life. It's, it's something that you, you actually use. And so a great piece of content does that job really well. So if you, um, if you want to cheer up your friend who's feeling down, that great piece of content might be something that is some silly meme or piece of humor that isn't really something you would think of in, as great content in a formal sense. But if it does the job where your friend sees it and they feel better, 
or they, you know, then that, then that's a, a great a great piece of content. Or if you grew up in a with a weird background or or a different background or something that a lot of people around you aren't familiar with, and there's a, a post or a video that perfectly expresses what that is like, the job of that content might be to share with your friends so they understand how you grew up and what your life was like, and so. Um, oftentimes when we're, th we're talking about what is good content at BuzzFeed, those are the kind of conversations we're having. They're kind of pretty different than the, 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 the conversations that you might see at a, a traditional film you know, or TV studio where a lot of it is about, oh, how is it shot and you know, w w what's the story arc or something. Uh, a lot of it is, can people use this content for something in their life that matters to them and, and is it, does it do a good job of, the, of, of, of that? That is different than news content, though, right? I mean, like, you've got, again, uh, I was talking about Charlie Warzel. I think he's great. He wrote a great piece about the cyber apocalypse that's coming. Lots of people shared that. But oftentimes, it's a great news story that you don't necessarily want to share. You just want to read it. That's a, I'm assuming that's a different skill set and a different Yeah, but you can still look a bit th through, through the lens of jobs. So maybe the job is I, it, I want to be informed about the world, something as, as simple as that. Maybe the job is um, I want to look smart, or so you're sharing it to, to say, oh, I read this complicated article. That's why people share Harvard Business Review articles, for example. Um, sorry, I know like a third of you share Harvard Business Review articles, and I've like insulted a third of the audience, but. Um, Anyway. Jonah just called you up. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Peter. Jonah. Um, actually, two years ago, I think it was the podcast that you guys both did together where you laid out the distributed model. I actually ran up to you, Jonah, at a conference last year and said, thank you for doing that because I work at a traditional media company and we were trying to push for a while. The world's changing. Eyeballs are shifting all that stuff. I'm curious with your experience at NBC right now and everything you guys are doing and you know, for some of those folks that are on the traditional side, with all the disintermediation and you know, kind of going back and forth now between all these, if you're at a traditional media company, what would you be doing? So, just curious. If I was at a traditional media company? Yeah, as far as you know, with the distributed model, which you know, we've had a big swing in 18 months, just what would you be doing? So, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. It feels like traditional media companies in some ways are pulling back from digital right now. Like, you hear people who were at traditional media companies that were investing a lot in digital, and now they're saying, ah, actually, we're, we're just focusing on TV, or we're just focusing on the, the, the stuff thing that, that makes money. Yeah, the thing that makes money. It's hard. It takes a long time and, and, and a lot of investment to build great digital properties. Think how much money was spent investing. And, you know, any, any successful digital company, a lot of money is invested before it becomes a good business. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. So I, I feel like if you're a traditional media company, you could have a strategy, which is we're not going to try to do digital content. We're just going to treat digital content as a marketing vehicle for our other kinds of content. And so we'll, we'll invest in it to the extent that it's driving our other businesses. And, and that's not necessarily a bad, a bad strategy. Um, or you might um, have to do something like a company that's only partially owned or some kind of spin-off or something that where, where people can actually get excited about the fact that you, you made, you know, the new digital venture made $20 million or something. And it's hard to get excited about a venture that, you know, is two years old and is growing quickly and is making $20 million that year um, if you are one of the giant media companies. But if, you, if you're a founder and you start a company that does that, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I built this thing and now we're going to make $20 million this year. It's like amazing. And so I think you, if you're a traditional media company, you either need to figure out how to solve that problem. You either need to figure out how digital can help your core business, or you need to figure out how you can make something that isn't going to get bogged down or seem irrelevant compared to your, your, your core what business. What do you think you do for NBC in that context? They put a bunch of money into you. What, what are you doing for them for the $400 million they put into you? Well, so I, I, I think you could see both the thing, examples I gave are, are things that you know we, we um, just uh, launched uh, something called Playful, which is a parenting uh, brand that we're doing in partnership with NBC. And that will be more like the second example, where you make something new that we're both excited about, and the team and people working on it are excited about it. Um, and then you also, it also could be you know, working on new kinds of marketing and digital advertising and ways of using the internet to, to drive people to watch you know, universal you know, movies or NBC shows, things like that. Cool. Richard. Hey, Jonah. Um, when you think about, you know, I guess it would be hard to sit through this first day at Recode, Code Media, and not, you know, everyone talks about Facebook, everyone talks about what's going on on YouTube and kind of the obsession over how you're going to make money. But, you know, you mentioned Twitter briefly. I'd love your thoughts on kind of the Twitter platform for you as a publisher. 
what's working, what's not. And then I guess the elephant in the room, the millennial brand for um, social and mobile is, is Snapchat. Where does Snapchat fit in? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Do you like what they're doing with the new Discover and, and that platform? But how does that fit into where you're creating content and your ability, most importantly for both Twitter and Snapchat, your ability as a publisher to make real money? Yeah, so uh, we already mentioned the AM to DM show, show on Twitter, so that is exciting. The Twitter, uh, for, for news, Twitter is really the pulse of, of news operations. It's where you um, often get, get information from sources. You know, people DM Peter things, and then they turn into stories the next day. Sometimes. Sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, and you also, uh, you know, get, get quick feedback uh, that lets you learn, you know, uh, what what audiences care about? Um, I think Snapchat is is also uh, you know really interesting. Very young, as you as you as you, as you point out, uh, when you uh, see Twitter, you know Twitter and Snapchat having a good quarter at the the same the same quarter that Mark Zuckerberg talks about, you know slight decline in engagement on Facebook. People have their mobile device, and if you find, you know, you catch up with your friends on Facebook and see a little bit of content, but there's maybe a little less long content there and a little less of certain things, you're going to, you know, before your, your bus shows up or before your next meeting or whatever, you know, t time you're killing, you're going to close Facebook and you're going to open Twitter or you're going to open Snapchat. Like, people use multiple apps. Young people in particular use multiple apps. There's no young person who just says, oh, I only am on you know, one, you know, just on Snapchat or just on Instagram, like they, they use all, all, the, all these different apps. And so being on all the different apps like helps you learn about different um, behaviors and helps you learn about your audience and helps you connect with people. And you get beyond the artifacts of just the algorithms and the interfaces and you start to understand what people actually care about. And that's the thing that ultimately helps our business in the long run is having a deeper understanding of culture and what matters to people and using that to, to connect with people in a deeper way. And to, uh, that includes advertising, it includes commerce, it includes you know, getting people to, to discover our shows and, and, and things we're doing with our studio. Um, so I, I feel like these, the, having a, um, strong platforms that all do what they're good at. And that feels like what's happening right now in, in the industry. Like the, everyone is pivoting to what they're best at. You know, Facebook is pivoting towards not being a, trying to be a, a, a crappy version of YouTube and putting lots of you know, long videos that Facebook never really figured out how to monetize. They're pivoting back to social and sharing and that kind of engagement. And you know, Twitter is staying true to this fast Twitch stuff. And the traditional media companies are getting more in love with TV if that's what they do. or, or um, you know, subscription uh, for an elite, elite, you know, educated, affluent audience, if that's what their sweet spot is. And so I feel like you're seeing in the industry right now something that feels like a lot of turmoil, but another way to look at it is people are going back to the things that they're best at, and um, I think there's a lot that's good about that. That's a nice, positive way to end the first night. All right. Thank you, Jonah. All right, thank you.